Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. On April 25th, 1983, Pioneer 10 became the first man-made object to pass by Pluto. And then, on June 13th, it left the solar system. Now, Pluto has had its ups and downs throughout history as what we have known as a planet, (laughs) and not a planet. Well, now it's even classified as what they call a dwarf planet. The air quotes career of Pluto is similar to this week's guest, classified by many too small to succeed. But two days after Pioneer 10 pushed past Pluto, this week's guest had his own moment, and it all revolved around the NFL draft. Welcome to the Football History Dude Podcast, where each episode is a journey back in time to learn about the rich history of the NFL. Your host is Arnie Chapman. Football is his passion, and he wants you to come along with him to explore the yesteryear of the gridiron. So hop on board his DeLorean, and let's get this baby up to 88 miles per hour. This time as we step out the DeLorean, the date is April 26th. 1983 at the New York Sheraton Hotel in New York City. And we'll be here for the 27th as well because we're here to witness what many believe as one of the greatest draft classes of all time. This was also known as the year of the quarterback with an unprecedented six quarterbacks going in the first round. But it was much more than just the year of the quarterback. I mean, there were a Hall of Famers galore and a blockbuster trade involving one Mr. John Elway. So let's stop there. John Elway, all these quarterbacks, Denver Broncos. There's a guy that may have gotten lost in the shuffle because today he would not have even been drafted. I mean, he wasn't drafted until the 12th round of the draft. Now we only go up to seven. This is a guy that although he wasn't drafted until the 12th round, almost not drafted at all, he would make quarterbacks run in fear. And many of these guys are drafted. This dude was Carl Mecklenburg, one of the most versatile players in NFL history. And speaking of the draft, I really wish I would have asked Carl this during the interview, but he was also drafted 246 by the Chicago team of the USFL for the league's first season. Didn't get into that, but what we did get into was something, you know it, we talked about the Detroit Lions, and that's where we're going to kind of open up this interview about a story that his buddies will never let him live down. And of course, Talk about Barry Sanders a little bit there, too. But first, let me give you just the first couple of paragraphs from the bio on his website. And it goes as such. Quote, Former Denver Broncos captain and all-pro linebacker Carl Mecklenburg rose from being a college walk-on and a 12th round pick to a pro career that included six Pro Bowl and three Super Bowl appearances. Considered the NFL's most versatile player, Carl played all seven defensive front positions. Bronco coaches wanted him at the point of attack and would move him throughout the game. There were games where Mecklenburg played even all seven positions during the course of a single game. In 2001, Carl was inducted into the Denver Broncos Ring of Fame and the Colorado Sports Hall of Fame. Carl was a semifinalist for the Pro Football Hall of Fame for eight consecutive years. End quote. Now, Carl is also a certified speaking professional and author, which we'll get to a little bit of that later in the interview. And if you want to learn more about Carl, you can head over to the website at sportshistorynetwork.com, which, you know, is the headquarters for sports yesteryear. And if you haven't subscribed for free to the show yet, then, well, <laughs> you need to mash that little subscribe button on your podcast player of choice. That way you get the hottest, freshest off the press episodes, well, each and every week. But for now, let's get into the interview with Carl Mecklenburg. To be honest with you, I mean, I don't know if you can 
tell my age here, but I don't remember too much of your playing career from my days. Uh, being a Lions guy, I Barry Sanders was there when I was old enough to know football. <laughs> so, well, I, I, I scored a touchdown on Thanksgiving against the Lions. <laughs> yeah, that was one of the things I wanted to ask you about. So, well, you know I mean, what? Let's... Actually, I take it back. I did not score a touchdown. I should have scored a touchdown, but the backup quarterback ran me down, which I never lived it down. To this day, I still get teased about that when <laughs> was that caught from was behind that Eric Kramer <laughs> yeah probably I don't yeah, know. Okay. <laughs> See, that's one thing I was gonna ask let's jump in there then we'll go back <laughs> I was gonna ask you the question um you know because I was trying to go through all the box scores and all the different times because being a Lions fan and the, the fans of my show know Barry Sanders is like you know that's my golden goose I'll get him on the show someday but uh I wanted to ask and I saw one game I'm like oh there's a timeline here maybe he did play against the Lions sure. and I so you had an interception, huh? Let's talk about had, that play. Yeah, I had an interception against the Lions on Thanksgiving. Um, clear field in front of me. Unfortunately, uh, I was drafted as a nose guard, and I still run like a nose guard. So they, the the backup quarterback had just come in the game, and we'd been pass rushing and pass rushing and pass rushing. So I was a little tired. That's my excuse anyway. He he ran me down. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I still can't tell about that from my friends, my <laughs> teammates. So yeah, I did. Uh, I did that, and I tackled Barry Sanders a bunch in that game. We were uh, they they were running the uh, run and shoot stuff so when whenever we did that i was playing nose guard um and and my job as described by our defensive coordinator is you you swim either the left or the right of the center uh and you, and you take a shot at barry and he's not going to be where he is so either go left or go right uh and and you got a 50 50 chance of getting your hands on him <laughs> so so we all did that just somebody just take a shot one don't go where he is because he's not going to be there. Just take a shot on either side. And that's what we did. And that was the only time you actually had a chance to play against him, right? I played against him in the Pro Bowl a number of times too. Uh, yeah, but did the so was the Pro Bowl back then? Did you actually did you guys actually play or was it like oh, this kind yeah. of Pro Bowl stuff nowadays? Oh yeah, you had to play, man. It, the, <laughs> <laughs> the uh the losing team got five thousand dollars and the winning team got ten thousand uh, dollars each person. And my family had already spent ten thousand dollars. I was there to win. <laughs> we were <laughs> everybody would come to Hawaii and we'd have a big time, but but yeah, so I no, we played to win, no doubt about it. And and things uh things have changed obviously in that that game but no it was uh anytime you get on the football field i think you're more likely to get injured if you're not going full speed uh than if you are going full speed so i i know i was i was full i was full full bore yeah i've heard that from somebody else before too if you take anything off then you're actually more liable to get hurt like when you're going i think it was even maybe my coach that said that if you don't go all in then you know there's a better chance you'll get hurt than if you're going right at it kind of thing and you mentioned, okay, so let's dig into it, Pro Bowls, and that's where I was going to start the show off. I wanted to ask you about Barry Sanders, so we got, <laughs> we got that. But uh, So w there's much talk as I, I, I research your career and everything, and I see, of course, the the Denver Ring of Fame and all these other types of things. But uh, something that jumped out to me, like I'm sure everyone else, the, the versatility and playing all seven positions with the, my, my mind is just unfathomable because I'm like, how can somebody do that? Bill Belichick must have like loved that style if you could uh, hear that type of a player. Too big for a linebacker, too small for a defensive end or defensive lineman. I mean, what did you tell people you were? What, or how did you describe your position to somebody, somebody asking? Well, if, if if I had to pick something, I was an inside linebacker. Um, I was drafted as a nose guard. I uh, got injured during that first training camp. They moved me out to defensive end. Uh, a couple of years into my career, uh, the coaches came to me and said, we love what you're doing as a special teams player and a, and a third down pass rusher at defensive end, but we think you can help the team more at a linebacker. Uh, switched me to linebacker, um, played, uh, played six games at linebacker, made the uh, Pro Bowl as an all-pro linebacker that year. Um, I was a linebacker and that nobody had ever put me at that position. Um, so uh, I, I think the versatility thing truly was the brainchild of Joe Collier. He was our defensive coordinator. Um, Joe Collier, uh, Merle Moore, the linebacker coach, Stan Jones, the defensive line coach, kind of got together and said, you know, uh, Carl's a great pass rusher. Um, we can use him in situations that, that 
by moving him around, make matchup problems for other teams. He's, he's he can he can play on either side. He can play off the ball. Uh, you know, if anybody if, if there's a weak spot or if they're if if they have tendencies to like run to the wide side of the field or tendencies to uh, you know like when like I said when we played run and shoot, I was always over the nose because uh, uh, they wanted me pass rushing every play, uh, and that's that's how they did it. And and so they they move me around all the time. Like like you said, sometimes. Uh, sometimes all seven front positions in a, in a single game. Um, but it wasn't just for the sake of moving somebody around. It was because they were, they wanted me to be at the point of attack. They wanted me to be, uh, you know, where they think that thought the ball was going. And if, if Joe thought the ball was, you know, if I, if I was best suited playing on the, you know, on the right side, uh, against uh, the Pittsburgh Steelers because they always ran to the right side or to the short side of the field or the wide side of the field, whatever it was, that's where I'd play. And uh, it was a it was a great opportunity and it was an interesting thing too because not only did I have to know seven different front uh, seven different positions and as an inside linebacker and the play caller, I should know everybody's position, uh, but everybody else had to know two positions, and and it's really unusual to have uh, a group of guys that can can handle that mentally to to cover two different positions in in the NFL um, so so everybody in the front seven had to know two positions for just to use me the way they used me so I mean I did see that in one of the articles your IQ test or whatever it would have been called coming out of college was pretty high so the entire defense you're saying the cognitive ability was maybe higher than what is normal i think so yeah um that yeah i i i uh scored the highest in there it's kind of like jumbo shrimp right the intelligence test in the nfl (laughs) i was the the highest in in that draft class so (laughs) but it was uh i you know truthfully for me i was a better professional football player than i was a college football player and i was a better college football player than i was a high school player um every step of the way it becomes more and more of a mental game and less and less of a uh, obviously you have to have a, the baseline physical talent but uh but it becomes more and more mental every step up you go in the in in in, in the uh football world i mean i could not understand that um we're going to dig into that whole going back to your high school days but the Things you hear about, we'll just go to the legends of the football, for instance, Jerry Rice or the Michael Jordans. We'll go to Muhammad Ali. All the, I don't know if I like using the term goat because, you know, there's, it's impossible to go from era to era, I think, but it almost came easier to them because of all the work that they put in, the mental preparedness and all these types of things. And with that being said, were you a football fan growing up? Did you watch players of the NFL at all or did it kind of fall in line there? Yeah, you know, I did, but I mean, I was, I did everything. I, I was, uh, if you, if you asked me when I was uh, 12 years old, are you going to be a professional football player? I'd say, I just said, no, I'd be a, I'm going to be a uh, hockey player. I, I love playing hockey. I was a goalie. Uh, you know, Carly, you're the big kid. You can carry the pads home. So you're the goalie. <laughs> and, uh, I, I, uh, I learned a lot from that, truthfully, that helped me in the NFL. Actually, the angles you use as a goalie are, are real similar to the the angle things you have to do as a linebacker. Um, the side to side motion, the skating motion. Uh, I developed strength between my uh, my waist and my knees that uh, allowed me to make that switch to linebacker. I can move back and forth laterally as quickly as I could forward, and that that is very helpful as a linebacker and as a pass rusher. So. Uh, I did that. I played. Uh, I played hockey. I played baseball. I, I played the baritone horn. I was in the Boy Scout. I did everything as a kid, and 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 uh, I think that's a, the way to do it. I, I'm. I think a lot of kids uh, um, hurt their chances to be a professional athlete by focusing on one sport too early. Um, any, anybody who understands, uh, body kinetics understands that, uh, cross training, doing all kinds of different motions, uh, allows you to be a better athlete down the line. Yes. You'd probably be a better baseball player if you just play baseball and, and that's all you do, um, until you're in high school, but you know, nobody makes a living in high school. <laughs> so it's, it, it, you got you got to get past that, and then you know you, you know, make the pro team. And the only way that happens is if you're you're an all around really good athlete. I think. 
Yeah, I mean, that makes sense to me too. And then to have to go through the different adversities of multiple challenges versus getting in that same zone of one. And, you know, what, what, what drove you to, I mean, did I, maybe I didn't read it right, but you missed out or you got cut from so many teams and then you just kept persevering through high school or how'd that go? Yeah, no, I was, uh, I was a JV player as a junior in high school. I didn't make the varsity team. Um, as a senior in high school, I made the varsity team. Uh, I was a all state uh, tight end and an all state defensive end in Minnesota, but I was only six feet tall and 200 pounds. Uh, I wasn't big enough to play major college football, so I went to Augustana College in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, a little Division II school um, uh, on a one third scholarship. Uh, with the understanding, if I played well, they give me a full scholarship. And I got there, I grew three inches and 40 pounds my first year of college. Uh, all of a sudden, I, w- I was pretty good. My, my my second year there, I led the team in sacks. I played every down on defense, was was a leader on the team. Uh, I expected when I, when I went in for that debriefing session that every coach has where they call you in and sit you down and talk about last year and what to expect next year, I was expecting him to say, Carl, you know, we love what you've done. You're a leader on this team. You know, that, that scholarship we talked about in, in your family's living room, uh, you know, we're going to, we're going to hook you up with that. He, he sat me down. He said, Carl, we know your dad's a doctor. He can afford this school. We're going to take away your scholarship and use it to bring someone else in. So, so I left Augustana and I walked on at the University of Minnesota. Uh, when you transfer between four-year colleges, you're ineligible to play in games. Uh, you can practice. So my job that year was to be a live blocking dummy. I was supposed to imitate the guy from the uh, from from Michigan State or Wisconsin or whoever we're playing that week. Uh, if I want to eat with a team, I got to sweep up the weight room or sweep up the locker room. Uh, usually they put your Jersey number on your laundry bag. The number on my laundry bag was number 114. <laughs> There's no 114 in football, obviously, but that's where I ranked at that point. Uh, but I, I, I was the best live blocking dummy that team had ever seen. Uh, as soon as I was eligible for a scholarship, they gave me one. I went through, through some challenges there. I hurt my knee uh, in the preseason game, like, uh, uh, a week after they gave me the scholarship, they tried to take the scholarship back. They can't take the scholarship back unless I give it up. And it, I mean, it got so bad they had me rehabbing my knee in the women's training room. They wouldn't let me go to the men's training room because my they, they were trying to get me to quit. Uh, I wasn't going to quit. Uh, the next year, I led the Big Ten in sacks, uh, tied with Andre Tippett. And there was a, it wasn't any question I belonged. And actually, I only played half the plays. Um, I alternated with a, with a senior that year. Next year, uh, I led the team in tackles, uh, had no missed tackles from defense, playing defensive tackle. That, that's real unusual. But I didn't get much pass, many pass rushing stats because we were so bad. Nobody had to pass. <laughs> we're, we're always behind. Uh, so so uh, I was drafted in the 12th round. I was a 310th pick of the draft. Um, a couple years later, I'm in the Pro Bowl. So, I, I mean, but it was uh, – it was a it was an interesting road. Uh, I, I I think one of the one of the challenges uh, in getting to pro football and then exceeding through pro football is that uh, most of the players that get an opportunity have always been the best player on their team. You know that that from from a football standpoint, very few of them have gone through the challenges that I went through just to to get, get a knock on the door, a call of, you know, it was a secretary called me at midnight, <laughs> but I got a call, dang it. So, so, uh, so yeah, I, you know, I got, I got that opportunity. Uh, I got to camp and, you know, the, the veterans were tough, man. They beat you up. And uh, for me, it was okay. Here I go again. I was ready for that. And truthfully, I think that's uh, why there are so many guys that come from tough backgrounds that are successful in the NFL because it's not, it's not that they've had struggles in football, but they've had struggles in life. And, and when they get to that struggle in football, they're like, okay, I've been here before. It's all right. I can, I can figure a way through this. Uh, and that, and that's, uh, you know, that's, that's how it worked for me. Yeah. I've always wondered that as well as some people were in, say football or a sport or whatever it is, that's all they have. And they pour so much energy into that. And 
by doing that, they come out on top of things and then they have, they have success with it. Sure. Yeah. I mean, obviously if you're going to be successful, you gotta, you gotta work at it. There's no question about that. I, I loved football. I love the contact of it. My dad says when I was 10 years old, he, he was late to my first football game. It was uh, football fundamentals, uh, you know, a bunch of little rug rats with the tape on their forehead with their name on it. So the coach could tell one from the other, you know, you bring your Jersey from home <laughs> and uh, playing this thing. And, and it, it was, it was my first game. And, and he's, like I said earlier, he's a doctor and he got there a little late because uh, he had rounds that morning and I was already done playing. And, and he came and put his arm around me thinking I was going to be sad that, it, that he missed my first game. And asked me, hey, Carl, what do you think about this football? And my response as a 10-year-old boy was, Dad, I really love the smash, guys. <laughs> I guess I was a linebacker, right? <laughs> right from day one. Right, yeah. It sounds like you already were. It was in your blood. And you mentioned your father, a doctor. I saw that. No, Not normally when I look people up, do their mother and father have Wikipedia pages themselves? And, you know, I know your father and was with doctor and then your mother with Ronald Reagan. I mean, what was the connection there? Yeah, uh, mom was the deputy secretary of health and human services in the Reagan administration. Um, mom was involved in the anti-abortion movement for years. Uh, and actually, Jimmy Carter uh, uh, put her up for that same job. But uh, the the guy in charge of uh, health and human services rejected her. <laughs> I guess they can do that. So anyway, the the um, the next the next president Ronald Reagan said, "All right, we're uh, we're going to get Marge in there." So, uh, yeah, so she did that for for a while. That was a that was an eye opener for her. Truthfully, she went in with all kinds of uh, hopes and dreams of, of making a huge difference at the federal level, and and it's really difficult to do at the federal level. Um, so many of the things that uh, really make a difference to to families and to uh, to uh, the people that health and human services deal with are, are local things, are, are uh, statewide things or citywide things. Uh, and to try and put a, an overarching program together that, that agrees to everybody's needs is really difficult. So, so she, she kind of left a, a bit dis disillusioned from the whole thing, but, uh, but it was a challenge and, and, uh, she was, she was there and she was part of it and, and she, she did, did, uh, um, you know, answered the bell, uh, and, and, and worked at it. Yeah. I, um, no, I, again, I'm, I'm not old enough to remember like the Reagan administration, but all I can think of is Reagan, the actor when Dr. Emmett Brown and back to the future. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, well, he, you know, he was, uh, he was, he was the guy who, uh, got the Berlin wall torn down, uh, and, and, had he had some had some uh real uh big steps in in dealing with communism and dealing with uh with the uh, cuba and dealing with the the berlin wall and dealing with, i mean there was he, there was uh ronald reagan uh i think changed the the course of history in many in many ways so i uh, i was uh i was proud my mom was part of that yeah so is that one of those where if you're outside looking in and you don't know the story and you only hear one liner, you don't realize some of the changes that have been made, maybe behind the scenes kind of deal. Yeah. Well, no, that was, that was way out in the open. Well, it was <laughs> so, out in the open, but like, no. um, yeah, maybe but, not covered the way that it is for someone of my age. Right. No, I, I agree. I agree. And it, it, uh, particularly, um, if, if you're learning from, uh, from school or you're learning from, uh, you know, press that they're, they're, they're liberal and, and Ronald Reagan was not liberal. <laughs> he was on, on the other side of that. Uh, he, he, he did some pretty amazing things as far as balancing the budget and doing things that, uh, nobody thought could be done. Um, and, and, uh, you know, got taxes down, uh, taxes were, uh, and the interest rates were at 12%, uh, under Jimmy Carter. And then, then under Ronald Reagan, things came down and it was, it was not, uh, you know, it, 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 it was, it was, a in my mind anyway, it was, it was a good step, but I was, uh, I was a young man then too. Uh, you know, I was, I was not, uh, somebody who was paying a ton of, ton of taxes and that kind of stuff at that point either. So it was, uh, it was, um, 
I, I wish I wish the uh, conservative parties would the people that are conservatives would go back to what what Ronald Reagan was instead of what conservatism has turned into in today's world. Hey, hey, it's halftime, and I have a promo from one of our partners on the network for you. This time, it's Oz Davis. The greatest of all time. North American sports media is inundated with the expression. When generational talent or even an acknowledged superstar plays in a game, that broadcast will be filled with affirmations of all-time greatness. So-and-so is the greatest quarterback of all time, or such-and-such is the greatest NBA player of all time. This rush to affix the greatest of all time label has extended to teams and even individual sports as well. Tweets, hot takes, and listicles pour into the mass consciousness that we like to call the internet within minutes, even within seconds of a game's conclusion. Almost as though our society has tacitly agreed upon this race to be the first to call someone the greatest MMA fighter of all time, the greatest head coach, the greatest offensive tackle, the greatest spin bowler of all time, the greatest middleweight champion, the greatest third line, the greatest offensive coordinator, the greatest WNBA player of all time. The expression, the greatest of all time, has become so ubiquitous that it has become more convenient to express the term with its acronym, GOAT. The greatest of all time. We say it, we hear it, we read it constantly and continuously. But what does that mean? My name is Oz Davis, and this is Truly the Ghost. Sports history as told through its superstars. How about that? Truly the Goats. I mean, speaking of that, <laughs> later on in this interview, you're going to hear me ask Carl about Flama the Great. I came up with this because it comes straight from episode two of Truly the Goats. And speaking of football, episode one is Jim Thorpe. But looks like halftime is over. Let's see what adjustments we made and get back into the interview with Carl Mecklenburg. Yeah, and I mean, speaking of challenges, I mean, the draft, going back to football, 12th round, but there was another guy that happened to be in that same draft class that you ended up clashing with against every day in practice. What was that like going against Elway in practice? The don't touch him. <laughs> don't. <laughs> If you if you hit John, it's a road map and an apple, man. You're gone. <laughs> so, um, you know, we had 13 rookies make it that year. That it, it, over a quarter of our team was rookies. Um, the the guy who owned the team at the time, a guy named Edgar Kaiser, uh, was a, a financier out of Canada. Not a guy that uh, was hanging around. I mean, basically, it was an investment for him. He wasn't engaged. Uh, he was thinking it was time to sell the team. Uh, and, and to do that, he wanted to lower the uh, the payroll. Uh, so, <laughs> so all the rookies got kept, basically, plus, you know, plus extras. Um, and, and, uh, it was uh, it was interesting. It was uh, it was a strange time. Fortunately, the guys that were that were there still, uh, the veteran guys, the Orange Crush guys that have been part of the uh, super first Super Bowl appearance of the for the Broncos, um, didn't take it the wrong way. They took it the right way, and they and they realized if if we were going to have a chance to do anything, they had to get us up to speed. And, and not only did they mentor us, uh, as far as, uh, as football, but really taught us how to be men. And it was, it was a great group and a great time. Um, you know, John Elway, Gary Kubiak, myself, uh, uh, all came into the team at that time and, and, and a whole bunch of other guys too, that, uh, that, uh, kind of came and went and it was, uh, it was fun. Uh, you know, John, John was, uh, John was such a great athlete. John was uh, was that guy I talked about earlier that had always been the best player on any team he'd been on. That was John. And and the fact of the matter is uh, he was not as effective early on as he could have been just because he never had had to study. He'd always been the, you know, it's just I, I run around and make a play. <laughs> and, uh, you know, a few years in, he figured out, you know, if you're going to, if you're going to excel in the NFL, if you're going to be the goat, if you're going to be one of the best that ever played, it's not just physical. Uh, there's a great guy. There are freak athletes in the NFL who don't make it because they can't make it mentally. Uh, 
John was, uh, was, uh, you know, the backup his first year and he got to play some and, and, you know, his second year, they, they handed him the reins and, and, and he was unbelievable against great teams against, uh, teams that weren't so good. Uh, he didn't pay that much attention. <laughs> we, we, you know, we, we, we beat a lot of good teams and we, we were really close against some, some not very good teams. And, and, and it was, it, it went back to John and, and I, 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 uh, he knows it. He knows that I say this, uh, but it's, you know, it's reality. And, and, and he figured it out and uh, Dan Reeves got him straightened out. And that, that offense was unbelievable to play a, 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 on defense uh, with, because uh, you knew you could take chances, right? You could blitz, you could take some guy and move him all over the place and do crazy stuff on defense because we knew just if it was close at, in the fourth quarter, we were going to win that game because, because as, as, as soon as uh, they let John loose and, and uh, got in that two minute drill, uh, he, we were unstoppable. And it was, uh, he, he I, I would like to see him in today's game where they're throwing the ball all over the yard all the time. Um, because he was he was unbelievable when it came time to do that uh, he he was uh, impossible to sack I mean I'm glad I never had to pass rush against him I I, I, I finally got a chance we were they had this flag football game thing at the at the Pro Bowl um, and uh, for some reason I was on uh, I was on uh, Steve Young's team and and uh, so I got to pass rush against John finally and and even though it was flag football, I gave him a pretty good shot when I was sacking him. <laughs> All those times I could have hit you in practice, but I didn't want to get fired. <laughs> now I can hit you. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's something like you said, playing in today's NFL and there's always the, because it's a history podcast, the conversation could yesterday's players play in today's and today's playing yesterday's and all those types of things. And we talk about all the different quarterbacks and such that, with today's rules and all that kind of thing, how they could have done. Johnny Unitas gets brought up quite often as well, uh, you know? Yeah, well, the, yes and no. Uh, John, one of the things that made John so effective was that he would just get blasted, dusted, just wiped out, and he'd get up the next play and throw a touchdown pass over and over and over again. And there are always guys that come into training camp who look like they're just world beaters just unbelievable when everybody's wearing shells and they're not hitting each other and then you get out on the on the practice field and i i mean off the practice field and on the game field and and it's live bullets and and they're they're afraid uh i mean it i saw it all the time i mean every year uh there was guys coming in who were who were great in in non-contact things but when it came to contact time that's that's uh what makes or breaks you as a professional football player. And, and I think that that's been taken away. I think guys like Johnny Unitas, guys like John Elway, guys like, uh, you know, Steve Young and, and uh, Joe Montana and those guys that, that did it under the threat of injury and the, and, and, and going to get hit. I mean, I, I remember playing it, you know, as, as long as you throw your hands up and pretend you're slowing down, you could run right over that quarterback. It doesn't matter when he threw the ball. <laughs> it was, it was irrelevant. So, and, and, uh, you know, it was, it was a physical game. Uh, and, and you look at, uh, you know, some of the guys that are playing in the NFL now, um, there's no way somebody could play into their forties, uh, back in the day there. That's, that's, ludicrous to think that could happen because it was, there was so much contact at that position. Uh, little guys like, uh, you know, Drew Brees or, uh, guys like that, they, they didn't last. I mean, they, they, you, you couldn't, uh, you, you had to be a, you had to be a solid dude to, to play back then as far as, 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 as far as playing quarterback, cause you were going to get hurt. You were going to get hit repeatedly you're going to have people land on you that was i mean if i if i if i when they try to make that rule of you can't land on the quarterback what do you you want the quarterback to land on you <laughs> i'm gonna land on the quarterback man that's my job uh so so yeah it's uh there's no way you can compare the guys that are playing now and and with the rules are playing now and then the guys that were playing back in the day when it was it was uh 
full blast, knock down, drag out. I mean, my job's to knock you out and your job is to knock me out and let's see who's, who, who does it. I mean, that, that was the deal. Speaking of that, who's the toughest player to ever go against that I probably have never heard of? <laughs> that you probably have never heard of. Um, you probably heard of him since you're a history guy, but John Hanna was the guy that that uh, just th- – he was like a tree stump, man. You run into him, and it just was like running into a wall. Uh, and and back then, they used to run this kind of student body sweep thing in New England where, uh, you know, they'd, they'd have a fullback in front, and they'd have a uh, – um, uh, tight end kind of H back guy in front and they pull guards and they, everybody's come, you know, coming around the corner. And as a linebacker, you can usually kind of hide behind the defensive end and, and that, that guard will lose you. Hannah would not lose you. And then terrible things would happen to you when he found you. <laughs> he, would, he was tough, man. It, I mean, there was no give you run into him. It's like running into a truck or something instead of running into a person. Uh, so yeah, he was, uh, he was special that way. Yeah. I mean, that's not a name that we've even brought up on the show, but yeah, I've, I've heard, I think a lot of people in my listening to my show know who that name is too, just even from the, the bone crush. And um, that's, so this has nothing to do with like on the field, but I saw, of course, when the, you were on the digitized and tech mobile and super tech mobile. Was that a big deal to you guys back then? Or did you really not care? Or I didn't know. Um, you know what, basically the, um, the, the game was franchised through the players association. Uh, that's how they got the rights to use the players. Uh, so anybody who was the player rep and I was the player rep for the Broncos, um, anybody who was the player rep got superpowers. <laughs> so I, I was, I, apparently I was a lot faster, uh, on Tecmo Bowl than I am in real life because I, I could r- run down Bo Jackson and all kinds of crazy stuff. <laughs> so you probably would have took it, you would have taken that interception against the Lions to the house too, probably. Yes, in that I game. would have. Yes, for <laughs> sure. <laughs> it was so, yeah. Um, the, uh, the Tecmo Bowl, yeah. I mean, it, ironically, there's a whole generation of people who that's how they know me is Tecmo Bowl. I mean, I run into them and they're, oh, first thing they want to know about is Tecmo Bowl. <laughs> and I'm like, wow, that's that's an interesting thing. But but uh, it was it was it's fun, you know. Anytime you get uh, kind of outside of of uh, football. Um, and, and do other things. I did commercials in, in Colorado, but I also did a couple of national things. I did a thing for uh, Diet Coke and I, I did, did some things like that. I, I had television shows. I had uh, radio uh, shows. I did, I, I did a bunch of stuff that was, was kind of fun outside of football. Yeah. I mean, as you kind of left football, we'll talk about like the speaking engagements, of course. And then your book, um, you mentioned the player rep, uh, so during the strike years, the what was that, 87 or 86 was? Yeah, it was 87, but yeah. What really, I mean, did you, were you, how long did that last? I forgot. It was six, seven games or something like that? Yeah, it, it took a while. It was, it was tough. Um, it was, uh, I mean, the NFL sent somebody with a big check and a promise, uh, uh, that I'd be in the, what they call it back then, the quarterback club, which was all the guys that do the national ads and then all that stuff. You know, they were, they were, they were trying to get guys to cross the line. Um, uh, just, it was dirty pool, man. <laughs> it was, it was rough, but I, I, as the player rep, as the, uh, as somebody who was committed to, uh, you know, trying to, trying to, um, kind of change the direction of the NFL, um, for me, I, I wanted to be able to look myself in the mirror, you know, you know, the big check be danged. I, I'm, I'm, I'm more concerned about, uh, the rest of my career and, and players who followed, uh, I, I think what's happened in, in football that, uh, you know, the free agency thing that, I mean, when I started, you, you couldn't even find out, uh, what the other players were making. You, you just had to, 
guess. <laughs> so, I mean, it was, it was a, str- it was a strange, uh, world when, when, when I started and, and it, and it evolved and it's evolved and it's evolved. And now the players get a percentage of the gross income of the league, uh, which I think is very fair. Uh, the owners get their percentage too, and, uh, they're going to make money regardless. Uh, so it's, a uh, it's a much better situation than it was before. Uh, now that there's a salary cap and a salary bottom, so every, you know everybody's equal as far as that goes. It used to be the the big market teams uh, had much more money and could it was like baseball. They could you know they could just basically buy championships. Um, now if you if you take that route where you're trying to buy a championship, it it hurts you down the line and you're not able to to maintain that. So it, it you know the you got to make the choices you're going along. So so uh, yeah, it was uh, it was a real deal. It was you know we're picketing, we're you know we're, we're getting hate mail and death threats, and I mean it was it was a uh, it was an interesting time. Yeah, I mean I like I mentioned I really. I've only ever known the NFL post free agency, you know, when that, that began. Uh, so when you're, you're one of the championship games, 86, uh, take me back to that night before the game. I was only like a year old or something like that, but what, <laughs> tell me the story <laughs> about the 86 championship game. So the 86 championship game, that's the game that's known as the drive. Uh, the, the Broncos were playing Cleveland in Cleveland. Um, we came, uh, Two days early, that's that was the rule. So we were in Cleveland. Uh, we we're going down to the stadium to uh, to have a walkthrough and just just see the stadium, which was that that thing was a dump, man. I mean, they had they had us in the baseball locker room. You had to hang your suit on a on a hot water pipe going overhead. Uh, you know, only had uh, 35, 30 uh, lockers, so. You know, you had to double up in the lockers and no hot water. And I mean, it was just, it was uh, the, the field was frozen. Uh, you could see the tracks from the game before in the mud. It, I mean, it was, it was, it was not, um, not a good situation and driving down there. There was nothing happening in downtown Cleveland at that point. There was, there was no uh, car. There was, we saw one person driving between our hotel and the stadium, and it was a, you know, a good ten mile drive, uh, and, and it was a, a, a transient uh, passed out against a wall with a. Uh, with sunglasses on and one glass missing <laughs> and with that that's who we saw as we're driving uh we, we passed a it used to be called a photo mat um you bring your uh, film in and it's just a little booth and it, they're standing on the corners in in cities all over the the country back then uh but this photo mat had been converted to a drive through bales bonds <laughs> I mean, that's where we were okay <laughs> it was as rough as you could possibly be uh and then uh saturday night or yes uh saturday night they're driving around our hotel all night long honking their horns and barking at us we get on the bus and take that same drive where we saw one person uh the day before the whole drive was lined with Browns fans cussing at us, yelling at us, throwing these uh, dog biscuits at us. I mean, it, it was us against the world. Uh, and, and we got there. The, uh, the, there literally were, you know, four inches of dog bones on our sidelines at the end of the game that they had thrown at us during the game. Uh, the the equipment manager gathered up a whole bunch of, of uh garbage bags full of, full of these dog bones. I actually brought home a couple for my dogs, <laughs> but, uh, but we went into that under those circumstances um, and, and figured out a way to win a game. Uh, and, and uh, that was a great team. I mean, those Cleveland teams, uh, you know, three times we beat them and, and all three, uh, I think, well, two out of the three times they were favored and all three times they were, I mean, they were, very very good teams uh so uh so that was uh that was a uh, and still is uh, some of my best memories of of uh my time with the Denver Broncos it, what a what a wild game and and back and forth and back and forth and you know the the drive that the the, the game is named after actually just tied the game um we uh we tied and we went into overtime um 
and uh, and our kicker kicked a field goal that went right over the top of the upright. Could have been no good as easily as it could have been good. Uh, but the ref lifted their hands, and there's no replays, <laughs> and and we're off to the Super Bowl. So it was, uh, yeah, it was it was a tight one and a and a cold one and a miserable one as far as the field goes, but uh, but a great one in in the result. Yeah, I mean, being on the defensive side of the ball, I'm in the moment. So, well, okay, maybe not just that play. Like, do you guys, when you're playing, realize at some point in time, like, this is something they're going to talk about for years to come? Yeah, I don't think you do. Um, I think if you get lost in that, there's so much going on on an NFL field. Um, and, and, and the majority of it's mental. Well, again, we're going back to that. You know, if you time a pro football game from snap to whistle and leave all the other stuff out, it's less than 10 minutes. From, of actual action, of actual, the ball is snapped and before the guy gets tackled, there's less than 10 minutes of that in an NFL football game. There's three hours, right? Less than 10 minutes. So the rest of it's adjustments. The rest of it's, uh, uh, you know, substituting players, bringing in, uh, you know, making calls, moving around, doing all the things that you have to do to have that explosive, you know, 2.5 seconds of, of, a, of an actual play. So, so from, from, uh, from, from, from that standpoint, uh, you know, everything is, is, is so mental and so many adjustments, so many things happening that you don't, you don't have time to think about any of that stuff. You're, you know, the, I, I think it would be a little disorienting to play this year when there's no fans in the stands, um, just because as a defensive, uh, player, um, you're, you're making all, all these calls and all these adjustments and stuff. And, and you're, you're hoping the other guys aren't listening and they're making all their calls and their adjustments and stuff. And, and they're hoping you're not listening. And usually it's so noisy. Nobody can listen anyway. Uh, but, but, uh, this year would have been kind of weird playing without, without all that noise. You know, I thought about that, not specifically in that regard, but like what the differences would be for playing in front of basically nobody and, you know, the whole, I had Jim McMahon on and I asked him about the whole, what he thought of the the home field advantage and being in mile high, his, his response might be different than yours and the other guys and everything like that. Like he would, I don't know, he, he would, Jim is Jim, the way that he responds. Well, yes. to things. <laughs> yeah. I know Jim. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So it's but well, getting back to you, it's a mental game. And then after getting out of the league, you you spent I know some time coaching. Are you still coaching now? Or no, I I, I helped coach my son's high school football team for a while, and that was fun. Uh, found myself getting sucked way too deep into it. I was I was gonna uh, be back in football and and not not be able to be around my family, which I wanted to be around my family. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, I did that for a little while and that was fun. Uh, like I said, but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't my future. Uh, I, I love what I do now. Uh, I'm a professional speaker. Uh, I have been for longer than I was a professional football player. I've been a professional speaker for 15 years. Um, I'm a certified speaking professional, which means, uh, it's the highest earned designation you can get from the national speakers association. Uh, it's, uh, I know what I'm doing. Uh, it's, it's not just, uh, you know, oh, let's bring this athlete out and, uh, you know, he'll tell a couple stories. Uh, yeah, I'll tell some stories, but they're all, there's all a purpose to everything I do as a professional speaker, like there was as a, as a professional athlete. So, um, we're, uh, we're deep in the uh, virtual world now. I'm, I'm doing, uh, I'm doing virtual presentations and it's a challenge to not have an audience. Like, like I was talking earlier with the, with, from football in that, uh, usually you, you read your audience and you, and, and you decide how long you're going to pause based on your audience's reaction to your, to your, uh, story or to the, to your point. And, and you make adjustments as you're on the fly because of, of what's going on in the audience and, and not having that feedback is a bit challenging. Um, but that's okay. Uh, I I've, I've done it enough times, um, that I understand when I need to pause and when I don't need to pause and that kind of stuff. So it works out great. Um, it is a challenge though, 
big piece of being a celebrity speaker is that uh, they want to shake your hand and they want to get their picture with you and they want an autograph and, the, and do all that kind of stuff. And that you can't really do that virtually. Uh, so you have to step beyond uh, the celebrity piece and, and, and really give them value. Um, reach out and, and, and make a difference in their lives, which is, is, is what you should do as a speaker anyway. So, uh, you know, the, the, the hand pressing and the, you know, kissing babies and whatever, that's, uh, th that's fine and dandy, but, uh, but that's not my job. My job is to help the meeting professional put on a, a memorable event. Uh, and that means I got to give them a keynote speech that, that makes a difference uh, to their organization uh, that touches on the points that, that we've already talked about uh, before the speech and, and, uh, and drives home the points that the, that, that the people in charge want me to drive home. So every, every presentation is tailored for their challenges and, 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 uh, you know, building up their, their positive things. And, and, uh, I love it. It's, uh, the thing I miss most from professional football is the adrenaline. And when you get up in front of a big crowd and, and give a speech, uh, there's no doubt that adrenaline's right there again. Uh, that I, I, I truly believe the reason, uh, some athletes get in trouble after they retire is because they're trying to find that adrenaline. And instead of finding it in positive things, they end up finding it in negative things. Uh, so that, uh, that was my, uh, that's my adrenaline is, is getting up and, and giving a speech. Yeah, I got a, so there's a guy I used to work with. He was former military, spent a, I don't know how many tours over like, across seas. He was a sniper. He was the, he was the guy in the, uh, the tank going and clearing out stuff. And then he came back home and he said the only way they could really feel that rush again. So he's, he just remember talking about riding a crotch rock, like 160 miles an hour or whatever it was and getting pulled over by a state trooper, of course. And well, he had the second guy had to pull him over. He was going too fast. And <laughs> the, you know, they explained it to the state trooper, what you know, they just got home and everything. And he said, I understand you let him off the hook, but you ever do it again because he was also overseas. So I can get that. I understand that adrenaline factor of, you know, what you're so used to. And that's a question I ask sometimes is you get to what maybe could be the pinnacle. And unless you're able to alter and change and shift gears, it could be difficult. I'm um, speaking of shifting gears. I'm going to get that DeLorean thing that I talk about right here oh, for okay. you. Okay. So here's your first DeLorean question. You get two. You're special. You get to go back and point in any time in history. We're getting up to 88 miles an hour. You and me going in the DeLorean, but you're going to go back to any huddle that you've been a part of, but not you on that side of the ball, the offensive huddle. And you can actually peer into the offensive huddle before one play or one drive in your career. What would it be? And that would be the off our offensive huddle or their offensive well, huddle. You could answer it either which way, but my intention was that you're on the defensive line right now. You're barking orders to your team or your linebacker, and on the other side, it's whatever quarterback. And you're, what do you want? You want to know what they're thinking. <laughs> so I get to, I get to uh, know the play. Okay, there was a play, and I don't remember the year. I'd have to look it up. Uh, let me see, 1991 probably. But uh, we're we're playing Buffalo in the AFC Championship game. We ended up losing that game ten to seven. Um, in in any of those losses, especially tight losses like that, there's plays that you regret. Uh, there was a a play that they uh, they threw a pass to their tight end. Uh, Simon Fletcher had a great pass rush. He hit he hit uh, um, their quarterback, and he kind of threw this fluttery ball out to the tight end. And I had bid on a on a on a on a fake move right at they were they had like eight yards for a first down and and the tight end went out and made a little fake like he was going to hook up right there and i bit on it and then he went deep uh and uh if i if i would not have bit on that fake if i would have just ran with him i probably would have intercepted the ball instead he caught the ball and they got within field goal range and we lost the game by three points uh so that that was the that particular uh play right there would be the would be the one I want. I wanted to hear Jim Kelly tell that tight end to, to, to run that fake against me. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I mean, you're, you're kind of breaking some of the rules. Or you're not supposed to change the outcome, you know, because the butterfly effect and everything. But yeah. we'll throw you in the glory. Again, we have, like I said, you get a bonus question. Normally, it's just one question. But you 
are going to be thrown back to the times. You're going to go against Flama the Great. Have you ever heard that name before? I don't re- recall if I have, no. Okay, so Flama the Great was arguably considered the greatest gladiator of all time back in the gladiator games. Oh, okay. You're going to be stuck in there. You're going against Flama the Great and whoever the second guy is. You can bring one former teammate with you to, to fight in arms. <laughs> Who are you taking? I'm Keith Bishop. <laughs> Keith, All right. Keith Bishop. Uh, Keith Bishop was uh, uh, a guard for the Broncos. Uh, was uh, the first Denver Bronco All Pro uh, offensive lineman uh, in the history of the team. Uh, he retired from the when he retired from football. He got involved uh, with armed services. Became, uh, I believe, he was a. a a ranger, uh, an army ranger, uh, did all kinds of secret stuff overseas. No, you know, nobody knows exactly what he did, but, uh, and then, uh, now he's the head of security for the Denver Broncos and, and has been for a long time. Um, but yeah, Keith Bishop was a bad man. <laughs> you don't want to mess. <laughs> Even Flama, I don't know, would be able to handle Keith Bishop. <laughs> so. Yeah, that, that sounds like you have a good ace in your pocket. You're going to be able to pull that one out if this ever scenario happens. But I appreciate it. We're going to do one of those open wrap sessions where you can discuss whatever portion you want, the six keys to success and some of your highlights, and then we'll wrap it up. Sounds good. So, uh, yeah, I talk, I, when I, when I give speeches, a a big part of it is my six keys to success. I talk about teamwork with leadership being the ultimate expression of teamwork, uh, courage, the courage to try new things and the courage to be decisive, which is the thing I'm going to choose to talk about after I give you these, uh, dedication, which is hard work, constant learning, refusing to quit desire. That's the dream, the passion, the mission, Uh, honesty and forgiveness with yourself and self-evaluation and with others. And finally, goal setting, reasonable, short-term specific steps that get you to those desires, those passions, those missions. And the reason I chose the courage to be decisive is the one I'm going to, I'm going to talk about is because I believe that's what allowed me to be the football player. I was, uh, I found out early on in my career, uh, that if I took the first step in the right direction before anybody else did, all the angles would change in my favor. Uh, the tight end couldn't pin me in. The guard couldn't cut me off. The fullback couldn't, couldn't keep me from getting the line of scrimmage. Everything changed. Uh, the question is, how can you be decisive? Well, to me, it's preparation. It's going into each situation with an understanding of what uh, what you're going to expect. Uh, you know, reading the the tea leaves, looking, you know, understanding the dir- the direction. I mean, for me as a as a linebacker, I could watch the offensive line and see how they lined up, how they were leaning. Uh, these are big ben- big men. They can't. They they got to cheat. They got to lean one way or the other. You know, they they line up a little deeper when it's a pass, and they spread out a little bit more when they're when uh, when when they're uh, running in that direction, and they tighten up if it's a short yardage thing. You know, the guy's hands on the ground shaking. You know, he's got a drive block. He's coming off the ball edge. I mean, you, you, if if you pay attention, uh, if you're prepared, and you allow yourself to go, that's the thing. I think people see things and understand things that are that are happening. And, and before uh, they allow themselves to go, they, they hesitate. And, and that, that hesitation is what the difference is between uh, an average football player and a great football player. A great football player goes. He, he understands when, when it's time to go, and he goes. If, if, you're, if you're not going, you're wrong every time. Right. If you go and you go the wrong way, well, that's better than not going because you're you're wrong every time if you're not going. Uh, so so to me that that courage to be decisive is huge, and that's not only on the football field. That's in relationships. That's in community. That's definitely in business. Uh, you know, if you if if you're the first one taking advantage of a situation in business, uh, you've got a chance to. Uh, to break down some barriers and, and, and have a great advantage over your competition. So, so to me, that courage to be decisive is huge. There you go. Carl Mecklenburg, one of the most versatile players in NFL history. I mean, it's pretty cool stories in there. Guy was a lot more lively even than I expected. A very good speaker, but man, I'll tell you what, that humor came through that teammate, type of mentality. I got to imagine that that's one reason why he was able to be successful for so long, even though he was too small to be a defensive lineman, too big to be a linebacker. But 
The coaches knew there was something there. They put him at the point of attack. And again, if you want to learn more about Carl, you can head over to the website, which is sportshistorynetwork.com, because we have many more podcasts and even other interviews and guests over there that you can get a wide range of topics covering the history of sports. Yes, we are the headquarters for sports yesteryear. But for now, dude, I'm through if you're through. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Football History Dude. To make sure you're the first to get the next episode, please subscribe on your podcast player of choice and head on over to thefootballhistorydude.com for the show notes and more information on the history of the NFL. And remember, dudes, where we're going, we don't need roads. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories, and Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.